Hi, welcome to Jazz Time with Ola England. Hey guys, it's the captain here, and today I have the great pleasure to interview uh, one of uh, YouTube's and Metal's finest players, uh, Mr. Ola England. Well, thank you so much. Welcome to welcome to the UK. Well, thank you. Um, for having me. So you guys know, obviously, in these interviews, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Ola's gear and stuff like that. But it's more 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 about just sort of getting to know Ola as a player. Um, so you've come over from Sweden. Born and bred in Sweden, home yes. of home of uh, many many you know popular metal bands and stuff like ABBA, yeah. like ABBA, yeah, absolutely. And um, what's the other one that I always take the Mickey out of Peter for liking? Aqua. Now they're no, Danish, aren't they? Oh yeah, they're Danish. No, sorry about that. Um, world. But uh, so take me back to you know childhood in in Sweden um, and growing up and learning to play the guitar. Uh, well, I started playing guitar when I was thirteen, something like that. Um, my dad played the guitar, and my uh, my brother and sister played piano, and and uh, my sister was also singing. Uh, but no pressure from anyone. I just played, started playing guitar because I wanted to yeah. when I was 13 years old. It was actually because of uh, Nirvana. Okay. And um, me being a teenager, and in, when you're a teenager, you finally kind of understand that uh, there's something more to this music than just you know. Yeah. So. Um, and uh, I learned three chords, and uh, yeah, I could probably play half of Nirvana songs after that. And uh, I mean, quick, pretty quickly started listening to metal, like uh, Pantera and Slayer and stuff like that. So that's how I started out, I would say. Because that, that, I think that Nirvana, uh, and at a similar time over in the UK, we had a, a couple of big bands, you know, Blur and Oasis, mm. that... that We'd kind of been as, as guitar music had been on this sort of journey of getting more and more and more technical yes. in, through the 80s. And then at the beginning of the 90s, it was very refreshing to kind of yeah. have that. So when did you realize that, um, you know, and, and, and when did you sort of first, was it Pantera that first made you realize, do you know what, there's more to playing guitar than just playing these three chords and I really want to... Yeah, I mean, I heard... I remember hearing like "Walk" by Pantera. You know the the riff. Dun, yeah. dun, 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 dun. I heard it for the first time. I was like, "Holy shit! What the hell is that?" I mean, it's I've never heard anything like that before, and yeah. it's like it really opened my up my mind for uh, guitar sound. I would say I was like, "Whoa!" I, I mean, I wasn't even aware you can make it sound like that. So it's actually that's kind of where my interest for guitar sound started, rather than yeah. you know being technically. Uh, impressive. I've always been more about production and mm -hmm. you know that part of guitar playing. And I heard that riff and it's like, wow, that's I'm never going back. I mean, that's how uh, did you then? You know, I mean, you've gone from you've gone from a real kind of riff-based player in Kurt Cobain to a kind of a a guy that had everything in his locker mm -hmm. with Dimebag. How did you? How did you then? You know, did you just lock yourself away and just think, right, I'm just going to do the guitar for ten hours a day until I can achieve that kind of? Yeah, but I never did. Right. Uh, that's the thing. I've never been a guy who practiced a lot. I mean, I mean, today I'm 34, so I've been playing guitar for 21 years. I mm -hmm. mean, if you just put it like that. But I mean, I haven't actually been practicing that much. I've been playing a lot of Diablo mm -hmm. 2 on my computer. And uh, I mean, if I wouldn't do, be doing that, I would probably be the next doing the mouse then. Yeah. Right but I mean, I've always been more about, I, at most, I would probably say that I practice maybe two hours a day. Like yeah. Max, you know, but that would be like really in intense practicing, just trying to learn songs. I've always been more about learning songs than rather than just uh, practicing so you scales. You're a fan so. of like Dimebag, the riff writer, rather than yes. Dimebag. Yes, I mean that's. I mean guy. he's an excellent lead lead player, but I mean his songwriting and yeah. riff writing. I mean just the like the simplicity of that walk riff. It's two yeah. notes with a bend. Yeah. I mean, that's more impressive to me making it memorable and how it gets a riff stuck in your head. I mean, that's what he had. And I'm, I don't think he gets enough credit for it. I mean, yeah. he was one of the best, like, complete guitar players out there. But people forget about his riff writing. And it's yeah. like, 
that needs to be... Did you, you ever get to see Pantera or yes. Damage Plan live? Or yes, I saw Pantera in uh, 2000 and then they were going back in 2001. I had the tickets and uh, that's when 9-11 happened. Right. And uh, Warner kept all their artists back in the US so I didn't get to see them. I, I saw Damage Plan. I never saw Pantera. And, and Dam it, this won't come as a surprise to anybody watching. Pantera and Damage Plan were never really kind of exactly my cup of tea. But I thought I've got to go and see this guy, Dimebag. He had, um, I think it was four Randall full stacks uh, with no heads on top, just the cabs, like two cabs. And on top of each cab was a shot glass. So four cabinets worth of shot glasses, each, I guess, with, you know, like this much Jack Daniels in yeah. each one. And just basically at any point through the gig where he wasn't playing guitar, he would go and, yeah. and he must have done two thirds of the Jack Daniels that was on yeah. top. And then he has this little bit in the middle of the show where the rest of the band walk off and he just plays for you know, like five yeah. minutes. And you just go, I couldn't even speak or stand up no. after consuming that much Jack. And he plays this. Yeah, that's probably insane. his like default mode. Yeah, right there. exactly. <laughs> So yeah, a ridiculous, ridiculously talented guitar player. But um, so now, why is it? Do you think then that uh, you know Scandinavia has this kind of fascination with? I know, I know you said ABBA, and yes, the biggest pop band probably in the world ever. But I think most, you know, as far as guitar bands are concerned, everything tends to be on that sort of more metal kind of side of things. Why do you think that is? I don't know. I mean, I think. It might be the long winters, yeah, maybe, and uh, I mean, uh, I think we had a lot of important bands, like you said, in the '80s. I mean, Europe was a very big band, yeah. it's a Swedish band, and I mean, uh, Yngwie and uh, is of course very important and set a kind of like a was kind of like a milestone for guitar players in Sweden, I would say. Yeah. So that probably started the whole thing about guitar-related uh, music, and I mean, um, Europe and. Uh, I mean, uh, there's a bunch of guitar players from that era that are just amazing. And I mean, it's, uh, I don't know, I think it's that there's a lot of depression, maybe. I don't really? Know. No, I, I have no idea. Cold I mean, and dark and angry. But I also think so. that, I mean, I mean we get, do get a lot of a head start because people are fascinated by like Scandinavian metal. Mm. It, it's like, okay, there's something mysterious about it or whatever. I mean, but uh, so we get a good head start with just having that. Then we don't have to be good. <laughs> so how, how old were you when you first thought, you know, I think I might uh, try and make a career out of playing the guitar? Um, I mean, it was actually kind of, it's not too long ago, I would say. I mean, I've always had bands uh, playing, but it's always as a hobby. Oh, so none of the bands were, prior to the YouTube thing, were you working and doing the, the I mean, we, we well? were doing, uh, we were playing shows. I mean, I had one band that I was with for almost more than 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we were basically just grinding and grinding, same pubs and yep. venues in Stockholm, just recording demo after demo. And, you know, same friends buys the demos and comes out to the shows and, you know, nothing really happening with yeah. the band. And uh, I can tell you that story. We actually got a record deal in 2007. Mm -hmm. Which We've, band was this with? Uh, it's a band called Subside. It's okay. no, no more after that. Mm -hmm. um, but we got a record deal and it's like, holy shit, finally, like this is gonna change our lives, right? Yeah. And uh, I mean, we were so happy and stoked and we recorded this album. And uh, two weeks after the release of the album, the record company filed for bankruptcy. So it was basically the death of that band. And you know, We've been grinding all these years, and I was just so happy about this whole record deal yeah. coming. And you know, we would finally make it and go out and, and uh, get chicks and and go out on tour and stuff like that. Uh, so I was like, okay, <laughs> screw you guys and everyone yeah. in the business, because I mean, that's kind of like the thing with having a band. You you want the record deal. That's like yeah. the first yeah. step, right? Yeah. But I was like so sick of it all, and I was like, okay, we have to quit this band. It, does, it won't happen. I mean, yeah. this was the nail in the coffin for that band. And that's when I just start, started to just do everything myself. Yeah. Do it your do it yourself attitude about everything. I think that's a the timing of that is quite good really and, and some good advice for everybody watching here is is you know, they're absolute I don't think any young uh, band can pin all their hopes anymore on this idea of, you know, someday some A&R guy will see the band and they'll sign us up and then we'll all be millionaires and everything will be wonderful. Yeah. You've really got to be quite, um, have almost that self-employed mentality now, haven't yes, you, about exactly. approaching. And I think that's 
probably one of my stronger points. Now. I mean, stronger side to me is because I was working as an accountant. Right. So I had my same Swedish work. death metal accountant. You don't get any more rock <laughs> exactly. than that, do you? <laughs> so, I mean, I, I have the, the same work ethic, I would say. Yeah. Um, my work day is like drop off my son and kids to daycare, go home, sit from eight to five, and that's it. I, I'm pretty good at not slagging around, I would yeah. say. I mean, I'm, when I'm at home, not touring, I'm working pretty hard, I would say. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons why I've it kind of made it to the point where I am today because I've had put in a lot of work into mm -hmm. it. I mean, it's also, of course, with a little bit of luck, but I mean, um, hard work will get you far, I would yeah. say. But you had, you know, you had quite some success touring, didn't you, with sort of Six Feet Under and mm -hmm. Haunted and Feared and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, um, did you ever sort of think to yourself, actually, do you know, what, I could do this sort of life on the road gigging thing and, you know, and that would be enough? Or? Yeah, it was actually before I joined The Haunted or Six Feet Under that I decided to to um, put all my time and effort into. So actually, when I went to uh, uh, NAMM in 2012, yeah. it was the I've been having my YouTube channel for a couple of years since 2009 for for Sear, uh, for for real what I've been doing videos. And I went to Nam, and uh, I was so shocked by all the people that recognized me, mm -hmm. you know, but because that was the first time I was out in public, not sitting behind my computer. Yeah. And I was like, ooh, people came up to me and, and thanked me for my videos because because of them they bought this or this amplifier yeah. or pickup or yeah. they learned about production or and stuff like that. So I was so overwhelmed that uh, I was still working as an accountant, but the day after Nam, I just quit my job. Because I really needed to see, like, yeah. if I can put full, all my full time into this, how far I could go. Yeah. And then the other, like, joining Six Feet Under and the Haunted was just, like, it, it happened along the way after. Um, and, I mean, it's, so it didn't really, I was planning on only doing the YouTube videos, but now I've got a chance to go out on tour and be a rock star and do the YouTube videos. So it's all for the good. <laughs> I think it's important, you know, to... to be able to do a mix of both. I think if you just did one, you, yep. you, you know, life would get a bit stale. And yep. certainly your YouTube channel, the fact that you can say, you know, I am a touring performing artist. I know, you, you know, the reason Rob is it's so, either, either one or the other. I mean, yeah. either you're a touring guitar player or you have a... Yeah. But Rob, Rob is so passionate about doing his door J thing yeah. because he kind of feels that, you know, he has to understand what it's like to be a working musician yeah. in order to be able to relate Yes. Properly across YouTube, yes. you know. But so, okay, so let's, let's talk about your sort of YouTube channel because, you know, I'm a fan, been subscribing for, you know, a few years now. Um, and I think you're probably, the, you're best known on your YouTube channel for the kind of the production technique, aren't you? The sort of, the, they have a very strong visual yeah. look and, uh, and you always get these sick sounds uh, when you're playing guitar, you know, over the tracks. And I've read loads of stuff on your, you know, channel about, you know, people say, you know, you say how you do stuff and things like that. But what, what can you tell to the guy, you know, what, what advice would you give to people who are, you know, I mean, trying to do their own YouTube videos and get some good guitar sounds? Yeah. And I think, first of all, you need to kind of find your own sound or mm -hmm. like what, 
what sound you're the best with, I would say. I mean, not, not everyone can will sound awesome just chugging. I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's uh, it's uh, kind of a. I mean, for me, it's been a, a pretty long search. I mean, you know, since I started and listening to Pantera, I was mm -hmm. like, you know, how did you manage to sound like that? And you know, why didn't I sound like that? It's, you know, stuff like that. So I've been, you know, buying and selling gear all throughout the years. You know, and I know what's out there, and. Uh, Getting an understanding of how to dial, just how to dial in an amplifier, yeah. and you know, using the right kind of pickups, and I mean, uh, you have to be kind of a gear nerd to to start off, I would yeah. say. And I mean, um, also just learning how to record yourself and record an amplifier is very important. And I mean, it's uh, like you said today. I mean, it's not like it was back in the day when. You just have a sound engineer put it up to a yeah. microphone. I mean, you have to know what you want and what you want to be portrayed when you're playing live, when you're doing a video. And I mean, it's so definitely learn your amp inside out and everything that goes with it. Yeah. And then you can start to find your own kind do, of. Do you, do you find that I often find it quite difficult when we're doing demonstrations is that um, often the best that you can make your amp sound recorded mm. isn't the no. best to make it sound in the room. No. So some, so you, you tell, give some, so, you know, how would you sort of, is there, is there any kind of thing that you go, do you know what, I always set the amp out yeah. like this to get a good sound, but then I know if I've got to record it, I have to, you know, maybe back the gain down or, you know, what's the... Exactly. I mean, it's, it, it will never sound. It, I mean, production is so hard because, I mean, like you said, it doesn't sound as, the same as in, when it's in the room. I mean, it's, you get this really ballsy mm. feeling with an amplifier, then you record it, it sounds super weak and, I mean, it's... It's uh, definitely an art in itself. And um, I definitely like backing down gain mm -hmm. because that definitely uh, clears a lot of things up, right? But I also like gain. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's kind of a, depends on the amplifier, I would say. And, uh, but at the end of the day, I mean, a lot of people say that, um, that a lot of my demos sound the same mm -hmm. because uh, I mean, and the amplifiers sound the same and I'm, that I make them sound the same. Yeah. And I mean, it's not, it's not something I, it's just how I always been doing it, you know. Yeah. I using it's the same fingers, I guess, and yeah. I mean the same setup with the cabinets, same room. I mean, it's uh, all. I, I certainly uh, think there there was one video that I remember. You got a Blackstar HT one, yeah, to sound yes, just like that could have been a you know that could have been a Pantera or well, maybe not, but yeah, know, that could have been a track on an album, yeah, uh, with a like one hundred ninety nine pound amp, exactly. You know. And I had a, uh, I mean. But I also kind of trick for a beat, uh, uh, for a, for a bit because, I also have like really heavy drums. Yeah. Heavy bass. Yeah. That carries everything. Yeah. So I mean, you can have a really weak sounding amplifier, yeah. but if as, as, uh, when you throw on a bass there, yeah. that's super heavy, it sounds. Yeah. Super. And are you heavy. tracking the guitars to the bass as well to give you that sort of extra? Yeah, I mean, I I try to carve down some bass. Yeah. And uh, people that have heard my recordings, they they hear that the bass is very. Existent and yeah. very, uh, it's very in the center. It's a lot of distortion. Yeah. It's very grindy and yeah. it's a big part of my song. Yeah, and uh, I mean with Are that, you, do you play the bass parts in? Yes, or you, you do. Yeah, okay. okay. Mm -hmm. uh, at least with Fear, mm -hmm. which is basically my kind of baby. I recorded everything myself. But I mean, if you have that heavy bass in the middle, the guitar guitars don't have to be mm -hmm. super heavy or uh, super well produced. And I guess that's why you know that. I suppose there's a lot of guitar amps over the years that, you know, when you try them in a guitar store, you mm. just sort of think, this amp just hasn't got any real sort of bass end. No. And yet whenever you see, you know, the, yeah. the, the, the amps that these kind of the real heavy rock guys are playing, yeah. you just think, how are they getting that sound? So it's just a big bass sound, isn't it? That's yeah. supplementing that. Uh, exactly. Do you, do you do a lot of double tracking on the guitar stuff? Uh, for demos, I usually just do one left, one right channel. Right. Because, I mean, it's I like having the, I like uh, tracking four I've done it mm -hmm. and tried it but I think when you have just one right one left the whole sound is more alive mm. in the sense that uh, it's not I mean because nowadays a lot of bands are super pro tools uh, cut up yeah. tracks you know and super um, tight and you know it's just too perfect mm. so I like having the more of a live feeling or more like a yeah. uh, what would you expect when when you saw me playing live and are you doing that by you playing to a click then are you to get that kind of uh, it depends tightness or it depends i mean for, like the for tight feel. for tight parts definitely with a click but i mean yeah. it's not 
you can get a total different feel of a riff if you yeah. play without a click and yeah. just play together with the drums. So it depends on the part, I would say. If it benefits from having a loose, looser kind of... Uh, we we, we were chatting over lunch, some friends of mine and Pete here as well. We, we were talking about that technique that came in in the 80s. Was it, was it Mutt Lang? We were saying where, where they would track every string oh, yeah. separately. You ever, done, you ever tried to do anything oh, like no. that? No, just <laughs> completely crazy, too time consuming. And oh, it, and I mean, it takes away a bit of the fun, I would say, mm. or like the, the beauty of it. I All mean, of the fun, I suspect. Yeah, I, I guess. I mean, I mean, a lot of my favorite albums are great because of their flaws. Right. You know, and I mean, it, even, some, even if Pantera is uh, the worst example, but I mean, they they were perfect, and they were recorded to a two inch. They didn't cut yeah. up shit or anything yeah. like that. I mean, but still, they do have small flaws that make that album yeah. that album. And I mean, a lot of bands today sound the same because there's no flaws. Yeah. Let's have a look at some of your sort of technique then, because I, I, you know, I mean, I, I'm I'm really interested in. You know, I'm a, I'm a guy. I'm a bit older than you are. Never really been into the sort of the the. The heavier kind of thing. So if I'm, if if ever Rob says to me, look, try and do this, this gent riff, and the riff itself on the left hand might not look that complicated, no. but I can never get the right hand, the right sound in. You know, I think that the picking technique is yeah. very. I'm always interested in kind of, you know, I might as well learn from someone that's really good at it. So, but that's where you're wrong because my picking technique is kind of awkward. Oh really? And, yeah, it's not. It's not. A, it's very weird actually, and it's. Uh, I had a t when I started playing guitar. I had one teacher that told me like, "Yeah, you're not doing it right. I mean, right. You should play like this. This is how how you should play. Like, yeah. Angled front. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, but I mean, uh, I hold it backwards. Like right. This. Okay. So you don't get that rasp. And that's it's totally different kind of sound. I would say. I mean, like this. It's it's pretty good for down. Uh, downstrokes, but as soon as you hit up, it sounds awful, but the way I'm picking it, the upstroke sounds kind of the same, like yeah. the downstrokes. I, I've always been more, you know, the macho thing about only playing downstrokes kind of thing. Uh, yeah. I'm not... The Metallica kind yeah, of thing where you can only... I mean, I've been, do, I've been doing that, but I mean, it's, I don't really, I'm a, you know, I try to be efficient really, so I, I like doing alternate. Yeah. I mean, I listen a lot to John Petrucci as well, and he's right. all about playing alternate. But, all the time. I, but even that, I still find again, if you want to, it, it, I know when you, I've been looking at some of the sort of the, the classic sort of yeah. Metallica stuff. Yeah. It's very much if you don't do everything as the downstroke, yeah. it, it doesn't seem to have the sort of driving aggression that you know if you're doing half of it on the upstroke. Yeah. It almost sounds softer, a bit la not lazier is the wrong word, but just. No, like that's it's not relaxed. Same. I mean, it's. It's a very. I mean, that's not that's not my regular technique yeah. right there. Since I'm playing, I mean, it's, it's the upstroke seems to have a softer yeah. edge to it, doesn't it? Yeah, um, definitely. But uh, I'm more about the efficient. <laughs> I'm lazy, sorry. <laughs> but I do like when I, we play the haunted. I do. Yeah, I do some downstroking. I mean, it's it's uh, also for show, I guess. Yeah. And what, and what other thing, you know, are you typically you're a you're a six string player, are you more than seven? Uh, lately I've been I've been playing seven strings a lot, but lately I've been playing more six string because I think I'm better at it. Yeah. It sounds better. In a conventional tuning or uh, this is in uh, in D standard, okay. so just a full step down. But on my seven string it's in standard. So you're not dropping the, the E string? Uh, it happens. Or, yeah. What with a Hornet I just have a standard D like this. Okay. And then with feared I just drop. That. So, obviously, YouTube has uh, given you the platform to sort of go from be, you know playing in some some cool bands, but into to, to you know a, a guitar player that you know doesn't really matter what country you're in in the world. If you like kind of metal and stuff, people are probably going to know who you are. So, how you know how's that kind of changed your your life? And, and what advice would you give to people that are perhaps trying to follow in your footsteps? I mean, I think first of all, you need to have the time. Mm -hmm. because there's a lot of time that you have to put into it to make it good. And I mean, uh, but like I told you earlier, I think it's more about see it as an investment in yourself. You know, and in my case, I mean, I didn't know anything about video editing, but I mean, YouTube, YouTube is out there. You just search for how to edit a video. Mm -hmm. You can learn it in one hour. And I mean, I didn't know anything about video production or how to even do 
do lights, but I learned from YouTube. Yeah. And I mean, the only thing I invested is my time. And I mean, I bought the, the lights, of course, but I yeah. mean, uh, it's, uh, I think that if you want to, like, if you want to start today, I think you really need to focus on making something different. Yes. Yeah. Because, I mean, when I started out th with the production reviews, I would call them that, you know, mm -hmm. seriously produced with a song and blah, yeah. playthrough yeah. with a review. I was kind of uh, alone with that kind of, uh, with the good quality, high definition camera. But I mean, everyone and their mother are doing it today. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's hard to even get a shot today. Yeah. I mean, it's the same with albums and bands. I mean, there's so many bands. There's some, it, the market is saturated. Yeah. And it's, uh, people have shorter um, expectation. I mean, what do you call it when it's... Uh, attention span? Exactly. Mm. Shorter attention span and uh, they'll not give you more than five seconds, you know. So you really need to make those first five seconds super... Mm. Awesome. Well, and just, and obviously, where Rob and I have been going wrong then, because we just talk about shit normally for the first 10 minutes, and then you know. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yes, ma note to self, make first five seconds of videos more interesting. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, people follow you because of, of what you're doing. Probably because of and I mean, it's, talk. Uh, it's because you're talking, and yeah. people follow me because I'm not talking. I mean, you have to see there's yeah. a, a big difference in what people expect. If I do a video of talking, people are going to... I mean, I've done a couple, and it's mm -hmm. fine. But I can't do the one hour talking because yeah. the people that watches my video, they don't have that attention span. And they, they don't. are now. They, yeah, 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 we're trying to, <laughs> trying to make that happen. <laughs> Everyone's asleep at the other yeah, end. Exactly. <laughs> at least all of my followers. So your followers are all like, yeah, oh, cool guy. <laughs> all right. Well, look, I mean, that's, I would say this. I always say the same to Ben. I see lots of people email me and say, you know, I want to start my own music store. What should I do? Yeah. And, I, and it, it's always, always, you've got to try and come up with something that people yeah. haven't done before. Otherwise, right. as you say, it's you're just competing against yeah. people with bigger channels and more yeah. money to invest in it. And, and I mean, I, I would say that, I mean, if I can do it, I think anyone can mm. do the same thing that I did. I'm, yeah. I'm not someone special. I was lucky because yeah. I started early. Well, yeah, yeah, you, and that's and why I kind of kept afloat. I, I think it's, you know, a lot of you guys, you know, you and Rob and all, all the kind of the early YouTube guys, um, they didn't get successful because they had the best equipment no. and the best, you know, and the, and the best knowledge. They were just interesting people to, 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 to watch. And you yeah. had your angle with the playing and yeah. Rob with his whole personality thing, you know, and... and so I, I I get that, and but you say as you start now, you just got to you got to have a, your own yeah. different angle, haven't you? And that's why guys like Jared and yep. Rob Scallon, they made it. They're they're yep. not that. I mean, they haven't been around for that long. Yeah. But they still like really cut. They through. did something different. Didn't exactly. They? Um, no, and there's loads of cool. And we were saying, you know, Pete Thorne's another one, you know, yes. favorite of mine, and loads of. But yeah, for for new guys, like you say, new guys, you got to find your your new angle. Hmm. Uh, I think we would perhaps hit on that new angle right at the beginning of the video. I think there's a, I think there's an opening for, for some sort of jazz, you know, jazz with a D. Um, you know, maybe, maybe we're, we're starting talk, a trend today. After that, okay. So look, so your uh, exposure through YouTube has um, opened up some some interesting opportunities. Exactly. There? I mean, it's. Uh... And even if I don't do it that many videos, I mean, it's, it's still very important to remember that it's because I'm here. That's why I'm here today. Mm. And I mean, that's why I have a guitar with my name on it and um, an app called Satan. <laughs> yes, <laughs> the, uh, absolutely. Well, we'll come on to that in a minute. Um, now, uh, Washburn are, you know, absolutely, you know, one, one of the kind of the, 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 the sort of the founder rock guitar brands, um, you know, um, with some killer uh, prestigious artist endorsees, I guess, you know, Nuno is, is probably the best known one, isn't he? Dimebag for a while, obviously, yeah. prior to the, the um, Dean thing was a, was a wash band guy. So it's kind of, you know, you're in, you've got some pretty big names to, to, to be in the same company. Of, yeah. Um, so how did the how did the Washburn deal kind of map out for you? I mean, it's um, I actually had another. I was endorsed by another brand, mm -hmm. and that contract just uh, expired. Basically. Is this the seven? Yes, strictly uh, seven. Strictly seven. Yes. And uh, that's a whole different discussion right there. But on my terms, everything between me and strictly seven are were good. Yeah. And my contract ran out. Yeah. Right. So 
Uh, and I actually had meetings with a couple of other brands as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, at Frankfurt that year, I don't know, three years ago, 2012? Yeah. 13? Maybe 13. 13, yeah. yeah. Um, I had meetings with a couple of them, but I had a meeting with Washburn and the guys at Washburn, and I was just, I was sold. I mean, on the guys. Mm. And the guitars, so they had their uh, new parallax thing yeah. going, tried a couple of guitars, and like one of them was just like, can I swear? Yes. There it is. Absolutely. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come up with some sort of comedy Viking noise to go over yeah, there. Right, uh, okay. <laughs> gotcha. So, I mean, I tried one of the guitars, I'm like, yeah, I have to have this guitar yeah. and bring it home. And uh, I mean, I talked to the guys and they were just uh, so passionate and um, it was, uh, I mean, it was for the right reasons. Yeah. And um, they really let me, they understand what I wanted. I wanted to have, I want to make something rather than yeah. just have something, a name put on a, put, put on a brand and a, a guitar that's already available. And um, they were really open. And I mean, in that sense, Washburn were kind of the, the underdog, mm -hmm. I would say, because they weren't, hadn't been really, around for the electric guitars in a while. So it was definitely like the right moment to mm. get together and um, it all worked out and uh, I'm very happy to be with them. And we're Let's have a look at some of, the, some of the kind of unique sort of features then that you've put on. Oh, in fact, we can, because we can talk about Parallax itself yep. has got some, so not just the, the, the solar models, mm. but um, I mean, I love the, I, I've always been a huge fan of the uh, Stevenson's extended yes. uh, cutaway. Gotcha. Uh, and you have, kind of some sort of through neck version of that, don't you? Yeah, it's, your... it's actually a set neck, but it's uh, inspired. I mean, it's just a full axis. Yeah. Um, Can we hold that up so that the... Like yeah, that, yeah. so it's very, uh, it's just very easy, accessible to play on the yeah. highest note. I want it to be in a guitar that's very, just easy to pick up and play and shred on, if, you, if you're into shred. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and so you say it's a so it's a set neck design rather than a through yes. neck. Um, and what are the do you, do you know what the, the timbers are that are used? Uh, on it? So alder wood. Okay. Um, maple neck. Yeah. Uh, ebony fretboard on that one. And super uh, smooth kind of. It's a great. Oh, it's such a great looking fretboard, isn't it? On there. It's just very shiny and. And then nice. you've gone uh, typically Swedish on us with the pickups. I think haven't you? Haven't you done the sort of the dark winter thing, isn't uh, it? No. Uh, oh, no, you're thinking of the black winter pickup. Yes. No, this is actually, uh, this uh, a new pickup called Duncan Solar. Oh, okay. So it's um, actually something new. Yeah. Um, the, where we had the Seymour Duncan Custom 5 Alnico. Okay. That's one of my favorite pickups. It's yeah. a medium output Alnico pickup. Yeah. So I'm not really into super high game pickups. Yeah. Uh, I like medium because they're more dynamic and yeah. you can play more cleans and the leads sound awesome. So we have that in here. It's uh, basically a, a variation of the Custom 5 Alnico mm -hmm. that we have for this guitar. And this is basically basically like a 59. Oh, okay. So almost a quite a vintage-y kind of yeah. vibe to the pickups there. Exactly. Interesting. I like that. I mean, it's you can still go shugging if you want yeah. and do the melody. Well, I'm a big... We, we discovered you know, four or five years ago doing the YouTube videos mm -hmm. that actually one of the worst metal sounds that you can get is a really high output pickup yes. into a really high gain amplifier. Yeah. And it took us a while to realize that that actually the reason all the metal guys back in the 80s and the 90s, particularly the 80s, mm -hmm. were using the super high output mm -hmm. humbuckers were because none of the amps actually had no. enough gain in exactly. them. Uh, so yes, there's a tip there if you're, you know, if you're, if you want to be, you know, get some of the kind of really killer, killer high gain, either get all the gain in the amp and some relatively vintage output sort of pickups, yeah. or, you know, get the, get, other, way get the other way around, so like yeah. a relatively low gain amp and some super high gain pickups. Anyway, um, what else we got? Is this a hip shot on here or a hip uh, shot it's a style? Fixed, yeah, it's hip shot style. Yeah. Uh, this blue one has some hip shot on it. Okay. We can go to talk yeah. about that one later, but I mean, it's very simple, otherwise it's a volume tone and a five way so you can split yeah. and make it sound more like a so you can get that feeling if you want and uh this is also available as a seven string and cool. an eight string and an eight string yes i don't think i've ever seen you play an eight string oh, i have a couple of songs you do, oh, do you I, yeah i do do you play them like because i know when i try and play an eight string I play all my guitars as if they're six strings. Exactly. So I can kind of cope with a seven string because I understand, yeah. you know, it's just there for a bit of extra chug. Eight string, I, I can't play at all. 
and the guys that I know that, that the guys I like who play eight yeah. string play it completely differently. Yeah. It's like a new instrument because you have to because if you play like the lowest string, mm -hmm. you'll sound like Meshuga, whatever you do. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's you have to do something different with it. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's definitely. I think it's very hard to write anything on eighth string because mm -hmm. it's uh, probably just too much for my head. <laughs> I'm not smart enough for an eighth string. I think. I mean, I'm not. Uh, I'm not toast, and I don't really see. I'm not a musical genius. I don't really have to have the eighth string. I mean, I'm. You played it. You played any of the fan fret stuff yet? You know? I have, but it's like it's not. Yeah, I mean, when it's a slight fan, it's yeah. all right. But other yeah. than that, I just think it's uh, awkward. Yeah. I've not, I've not tried one yet. We, our first delivery of fan fret guitars comes next year, and I, you just look at these things, and it's you know, do you, you know the artist that that draws that painting where the stairs go up and then right, they right. seem to like a, every time Salvador I look at a, yeah, something. every time I look at a fan fret, I was like, oh, yeah. this, this is a weird looking thing. But I get the, I get the concept. Yes. You know, if you want to play in a really low tuning with yeah. heavy strings, and then, you know. The skinnier strings at the top, yeah. you know, I can I can understand it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, but I haven't really Not think I don't thing. have a problem with the six string. I mean, yeah, it doesn't make sense. Because you don't actually, I'm surprised that you don't actually tune that low. If you, you were saying earlier on that D is fine for you, I was. I was uh, kind with of the thinking, Honda, we play in D and uh, drop. What is it? Drop C. So you see, you go pretty low. Uh, drop C and feared, right? right? Which is and the seven string, of course. So yeah. that, yeah. drop A. So it's, it's pretty low. Pretty time. low. <laughs> but I mean, it uh, depends for what type of song it is. I like to switch it up a bit. And so, what, show me the, so what's the difference between the blue one and the black one then? Uh, so this one is... The black, the blue one, yeah. Uh, that, one, that one is a Swamp Ash body, as you can see. So they're both made in the same country though, yes. so there's similar sort of money, are they? Yes. Uh, this one has a hip shot and I think, uh, yeah, locking tuners. Yeah. Um, Locking Grovers, but same pickups, just different body wood and uh, it's very pretty, isn't it? Yeah, that one. That's one I'll, of my I'll put some links in the uh, description below this so that you can dive over and find out more about these guitars. Uh, money wise, we'll 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 wait for someone over the back to shout roughly how much they are. Between six fifty and eleven hundred pounds. Ah, did you hear that? So between six fifty and eleven hundred, depending on the spec you go for. Um, what are you getting down? Are these? The higher end or the lower end of that sort of 650 to 1100? Uh, this is probably somewhere in between, in the middle. I would say. Uh, because there's also the Evertum models. Right. And um, those are... Uh, I have one right here. Oh, cool! Because this is something that, again, is total uh, magic wizardry, isn't it? It's just... Um... It's... Uh... For me, it's become a bridge that uh, I can't live without, really. And that's because again, you're you're just as you're hitting the strings hard, you just you can't keep the tuning. Not because no. of that. It's uh, just the hassle of tuning all the time. Oh, really? And uh, I mean, when I'm out on tour, uh, like this one, this is this guitar is so cold right now because it's been yeah. on a plane and stuff like that. But I mean, when we were on tour, I don't even bring a tuner with me anymore. I just pick out the guitar out of the case and I can play it. Uh, get up on 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 the stage and don't bother with tuning because I mean. I've had certain times where I've like, you know, when you're on a uh, warm backstage, yeah. you sit up and warm up, and then you go through a cold stage, and the guitars go all sharp or flat, and it's like, oh, you have to stand there and tune and blah blah blah. And, but I mean, all that is like you That's, just take away that out of the equation, if, right? If there. you guys aren't familiar with Evertune, um, it's a completely mechanical system. So there's no batteries or digital stuff going on. A completely mechanical system where the bridge essentially adds or removes tension from the string in real time all the time to keep the string in tune. Yep. So it's freaky in that even, you know, if you, you know, when you, if you really hit a string hard, particularly a detune string, it goes out of pitch before it comes back into yep. pitch. And Evertune corrects that kind of you can set it in up real like time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess because I found it hard as a player that does a lot of, you know, um, bending and vibrato stuff. I found it quite hard to get on with Evertune because it, it, I found it was sort of... I, will, I think it depends on how you set it up, basically. Yeah. I mean, if you set it up right, the, the, the bending is there, I mean. Right. And uh, I mean, it's not just the uh, touring, it's also like sitting at home writing as well. Yeah. I mean, when I was recording before, I would probably, you know, record a riff, tune, just yeah. to make, set, yeah. make sure the guitar is in tune for the next riff or yeah. whatever. 
but now I don't. I can just remove that out of the of the equation, and it just saves me a lot of momentum. I mean, when yeah. writing and recording. So I yeah, I'm totally in love with uh, this bridge I, right here. I should say as well, just to sort of you know set the record straight. Um, Rob and I did a review of some of the Parallax guitars, not the solo ones, but some of the Parallax guitars earlier this year, and we kind of kind of the review came out as you know what. All the hardware and the specification is great, and the build quality on the guitars is okay, but not top notch. And then, as luck would have it, that particular factory went bust or burnt down, or something tragic happened to it anyway. And so, over the last uh, six months or so, um, Washburn have sourced new factories for all the, the, the Parallax range, including the solar stuff. And I've got to be honest with you, this is like this is just chalk and cheese. This is this is uh, all of the stuff on the pre from the previous factory that I would kind of look at and go, mm -hmm, you know, I, I, I'm looking here, going, it's all perfect. So um, every cloud has a silver lining, as they say. Unless, of course, it was you that owned the factory and you lost your entire livelihood when it went bust. In which case, that cloud has no silver lining. <laughs> um, but for for Washburn and, and it's it's and for you guitar players out there, then it's all good. Uh, so yeah, very very cool. Um, I guess we should, uh... No, let's talk about that. Oh yes, let's talk about that! Let me put this back. So, this is, uh, this is definitely my, <laughs> my pride for this year. It's the, uh, I've always been a fan of, of pointy guitars, but yeah. I mean, I, there's just one guy who can play the dime bag shape like the, the yeah. ML shaped guitar and that's yeah. Dimebag. Yeah. So I mean, but uh, V's are, I always have a, had a soft spot for V's. And um, so this is the guitar we've been designing for the past two years, something like that. Wow. And I mean, because of the factory thing you, you yeah. mentioned, this has been delayed because yeah. it was, it's been ready for a while. But um, it's finally here. It's definitely, a, it's a bit different, it has mahogany. Is it? It yeah. feels quite light. Is it a chambered guitar then, or no, something? No, not at all. Let me feel. Let me... But it is very lightweight. Mm, it is. Maybe it's because it, of the V. There's not that much wood. Exactly, and it also something that we put a lot of effort into. Usually with uh, with V guitars is that they're neck heavy. Yeah. And d does neck uh, dies pretty easily. But we've kind of worked our way around this with this. <laughs> This, uh, you still have the, the axis, yep. higher upper fret axis, but you have the strap knob a little bit higher. I like where the jack socket goes, yes. that's nice. So it's very well balanced if, you, if you're using a strap or, yeah. it's, um, it's yeah, awesome. Cool. And it's very lightweight, yeah. so. And it's also available in white. Tunematic bridge, same pickups as on the other ones. Yeah. But instead of a five-way switch, you have a, a three-way and a push-pull. I like it. And this I like is it. this is what I play with the Haunted, right? Because yeah, you look, a, look badass on is, stage. I know what it is. It's it's it's, it's yeah. Rob he keeps going on about you know V's. He loves V's. In fact, he loves the what's the the kind of explorer shape of the ghost for it. You know, it's kind of just I don't know what it is with you rock and metal guys. It's just kind of like if it's not pointy, you just don't seem to you know you gotta have it pointy. Maybe it's. No, maybe they sound better. To impress better. on other guys. I it's guess. what it is, is it? Yeah. It's, it's like a weapon. It is a we I was about it's to like say, a, who has the biggest axe? Give me axe. my money! <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it looks, it looks kind of cool. Like, is the white one this sort of satin finish yes. as well? Yes. Yeah. The black hardware. That's very cool. Very, very cool. <laughs> Yeah, no, that sounds, that sounds, it sounds great. It's a great looking guitar. Um, should we talk about your amp? Yes. I think it's a pretty, you know, it's Christmas is coming soon. You're going to be lots of pictures of the nativity and, you know, things like that. So, you know, the appropriately named, let's talk about the Satan amp. Um, yeah. It's, uh, so we didn't go with the Jesus amplifier. Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, 
I think Fender are releasing that next year. Oh, so yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just as well. Um, it's just a clean channel. Yes, yeah, that's clean, it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm loving, we have to get the, uh, this is so funny. The, I hadn't even realised, Ola was saying that all of the G's on the panel are actually sixes, as I'm sure you guys can work out what happens if you put three sixes together. Except, of course, they look a little bit like a B. So we have a birth control here. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a sort of nativity appropriate. And a sweep control. For all of those of you whose wives have, uh, you know, been into labour recently, you'll know that you need a sweep before you give birth um, to potentially, what, a little Satan. Is what happens with uh, most people's children. Um, anyway, clearly you're going for... Um, a, a, a high gain death metal appropriate sort of vibe here aren't we so what was the i know i know we mock it but there's a very very well respected amp designer behind this isn't there yes so. it's uh, so it's mike forden who's um actually i met him before randall came along and uh i played one of his amps for one of my demos mm -hmm. uh, the the one of the forten amps forten yeah. natos was the okay. amp and i tried it and did a demo and i was so impressed that i had to uh, buy one yeah so i called mike or uh, Mike got a hold of me, and uh, we agreed to do some changes and stuff like that. And I was like, yeah, but it's going to be called the Fortin Satan. Yeah. Right. So he built the amp, uh, and uh, in there somewhere, Randall came along and hired Mike Fortin yeah. uh, to be their upcoming amp designer. And uh, with that, Randall also wanted to make a, this model, uh, production model. So that's how Randall came along, and I got a chance to go over to Mike's place in, in Toronto. Mm -hmm and uh, spent four days in his basement and we were just nerding out and uh, basically just uh, deciding the whole thing about it, you know, the features and making sure the tone stacks are to my liking, the power tubes, the, I mean, I, I didn't know that much about amps before, but mm -hmm. after that, I mean, I knew everything about chokes and transformers. I mean, it's uh, insane how much that can change mm -hmm. the sound. So, and this is the result, I mean, it's pretty simple. Two channels, right? Uh, yeah. Clean and uh, distorted. I mean, even if it's all for the distorted channel, the clean is really good. It's, pretty, it's very good, actually. Yeah. And it has a couple of different shift modes, which basically just removes the middle if you want that. And yeah. Bright switch. It's a it's a clean channel. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, nothing real more to it. But I mean, the main feature, of course, is the distorted channel, which is just a modern sounding distortion. Yeah, without having to use a, a foot switch or a, like a boost or anything like that. I did that. notice that you've put a, a separate uh, input here for an active pickup. So presumably that is is that like an attenuated input? Kind of like a lower. Yeah, it's not it's not as uh, it's a bit attenuated. Yeah, yeah. cool. Just to be able to handle, but. Even if I have active pickups, I still stick yeah. them in the passive. So let's let's hear the uh, oh really yeah. just maximum gain yeah. all the time. Uh, let's hear the let's hear the, the gain channel with your yeah. with your parallax guitar. So it's very modern sounding. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, this is just a guitar right into the yeah. amplifier and. Uh, that's a medium output pickup. Would you, you just you talking about? Would you normally have some sort of pedal plugged in the front of that then? Or uh, would you... I would probably use a, just a noise gate, okay. basically. But yeah. I mean, usually this volume we don't really need. But it's really still, need. yeah. I mean, it's still kind of even for having that much distortion, it's kind of mm -hmm. still not that noisy. Right? I mean, do you find do you find the noise gate as well as? removing the noise, uh, do you use it to kind of tighten up that kind of chugged riff as well, or do you just have no, it to get rid of the noise? No, I just have it just to get rid of the noise when I'm not playing it. Not to, because if I have it too uh, choppy, it just yeah. rocks with my leads. Yeah, it's got that kind of uh, 5150 kind of stealthy kind of, it's not, it, like you say, it's a modern game kind of exactly. sounding amplifier, isn't it? Um, again, just, I'm loving the sort of subtlety and uh, romance with the with the knobs. So there's a button in here that just says kill. Yeah. So what happens when you... You just add more gain. It's more gain. I mean... <laughs> Excellent. It's like uh, Ingwe said, you know, more is more. More is more. Less is not you say more. it more like Ingwe than I do. Yeah. Um, well, let's... So if you can chug and then... And then uh... So 
you think the regular channel is not gaining enough? You have more gain. You have more gain. But, uh, it's, more gain. Uh, you and, have I, gain. and I can. Uh, when you were designing this with with Mike, did you specifically say I need an amp that weighs about the same as um, a family car, or did you did you sort of go? Was that just an accident? No, yeah. I mean the reason why it weighs so much is because the transformers are so. Ma oh, just massive, massive yeah. But this and thing here weighs like, you know, twice as much as a regular 4x12. It so has you to you if have, you have a... You have roadies, I guess, do you? Yeah, I never so. carry one of those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not my thing to carry those. <laughs> so, but that, I mean, it's an interesting point, isn't it? Because I, I think, technically speaking, it's a, it's, a, it's a thicker, heavier ply than most cabinet manufacturers are using, which, of course, gives you the downside of it being unbelievably heavy but on the plus side I think the idea is that you know it shouldn't move and should project yeah. um, you know project forward obviously we're not anything like as loud in here as you would be at sort of gig volume but it's a cool looking amplifier yep. I'll give you that yeah um, I'm likely to see any in your local church band but um, you know but I suspect there'll be a few metal guys out there rocking the Satan he says as half my subscribers unsubscribe. <laughs> um, sorry about that. I'm not a Satanist, by the way. It's no, just to, it's just all, to keep that clear. Can it, can, it is all tongue in cheek. You are very sarcastic, yes. sarcastic and ironic, and Swedes, yes. Swedes are. Yes. Say. So it, just keep that in, in mind. Yes, absolutely. I can vouch for that. Hell, um, Satan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See ya. So, yeah, here we go. Absolutely. <laughs> We just hit 100,000 subscribers yesterday, and you're right, we're now back at 50,000. Yes. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, cool. Um, well, look, I've had a lot of fun talking to you about your, your, your new toys and your you know, career and how you've got, uh, you know, been so successful on YouTube. And long may it continue. I hope, I hope you're, you know, we'll be meeting again in another 10 years' time to talk about Definitely. some new special social media technology that you'll be a king of as well. It will happen. It will happen. Uh, but anyway, for now, I've been the captain, and this... I've been Ola. See you. <laughs>